So I'm standing here today with this beautiful titanium alloy Shimano Dura Ace nine speed cassette. This nine speed cassette was brought to market in 1996. That means we've only had 20 years of this technology or better. It's amazing to think back over the history of cycling, how bicycle gearing has come along. I just want you to reflect on how far we've come over the last hundred years. Think about cyclists 100, 150 years ago when bikes were invented. They had no bicycle gearing. If you think about the penny farthing, one rotation of the pedals meant one rotation of the wheel. The gearing was either the length of the pedal crank or more likely the size of that front wheel. That meant there was almost no controllability over the environment. The cyclist was actually at a tremendous disadvantage. That one-to-one -one ratio, by the way, of pedal rotation to wheel rotation, that does exist now, but it would be severe mountain biking. Uh, that one-to-one -one ratio is quite rare in road cycling. Now, a couple of inventions made it possible to move forward with bicycle gearing. The first thing that happened is the chain was invented by Lawson in 1879. And what that meant is there was a dissociation then between pedaling and the rotation of the pedal. 20 years later, in 1897, Ernest Sachs from Germany invented the freewheel hub. And what that meant was the cyclist could stop pedaling, and moreover, the tension on the chain could be eased. And those two inventions allowed bicycle gearing to develop in a way. Now you might say, well, that's ancient history. And I guess it was, because it wasn't until 1937 that gearing was first used in the Tour de France. But actually, bicycle gearing back then was incredibly antiquated. Riders actually had to change the gearing by hand or by foot, or actually dismount, get a new cassette, as in a fixed cassette on a fixed wheel, change the wheel or get the mechanic to change the gear for them and get back on the bike. Now, if you ask the public at large who invented the rear derailleur, which could be said to be an incredible invention in terms of being able to change gears, they'll probably say Campagnolo. And yeah, Campagnolo did bring about huge advances after the Second World War, for example, with their Grand Sport range from about 1949. However, Campagnolo didn't invent that parallelogram system. They used inventions that were already brought to market. In fact, the slant parallelogram was invented really by Suntor. Suntor um, brought the slant parallelogram to market with the Suntor Skitter in 1964. And that slant parallelogram became the standard for bicycle gearing for, well, until now, I guess. In fact, if you look at the way cyclists uh, rode in the 60s and 70s, they rode basically uh, two chain rings on the front, which were 52-42, by the way, only a 10-2 separation. And the reason for that 10-2 separation is they had what was called a straight block on the back, which was a six-speed cassette with a one-tooth difference between each of those, usually running from a 13 to 19. So they'd run 13 teeth at the smallest on the back, 19 at the largest, and at the front, they'd have a 52-42. The capacity to change gears was a lot less then because nearly all the derailleurs were short, short cage. It was only in 1974 when Campagnolo brought out their rally, Campagnolo rally, that we had wide availability of that long cage system. The idea behind the long cage, by the way, is it's a long arm on the rear derailleur and it increases the capacity. It increases the ability for the derailleur to go up to a bigger tooth. The short arm, short cage derailleur, even now, goes up to about a 28 tooth and the long cage derailleur goes up to, let's say, about a 34. It builds in more capacity in the system. So cyclists had those tight ratios, but only five or six speeds, as they were called, on the rear cassette. I wonder if you remember, like I did, how everyone used to compete in the 70s and 80s saying, oh, I've got a 10-speed bike, oh, I've got a 12-speed bike. What they meant by 12 speeds is six rings on the rear cassette and two on the front, multiply the two together, and you've got 12 speeds. Actually, the seven-speed cassette came out in the 80s, around about 87, quickly followed by the eight-speed in 88. But the nine-speed took another 10 years or so until it came out, like I said earlier, in 1996. And as you probably know, the 10-speed didn't come out till the year 2000 when Campag brought that to market. One of Campag's true inventions, by the way. In fact, SRAM and Shimano were playing catch-up with Campag, bringing out their 10-speed in around 2008. But by 2008, Campag had brought to market the 11-speed. Of course, we know with the SRAM Eagle, with the 12-speed system is also possible. In fact, there's no natural limit to where you can go. It's just that the more gears that you have, the more you have to compress it onto the drive side of the wheel, because the wheel has to fit between those two um, chainstays. So the cogs would get progressively narrower, the chain would get progressively narrower, and the chain rings would have to be progressively narrower, but it is possible. 
And I guarantee it's possible because SRAM have a patent on a 14 speed, as in 14 cog cassette system right now. And I guarantee that system exists in some lab in the world as we speak. So basically, bicycle gearing translates the rider's power into a reasonable cadence across a wide variety of situations, whether that's mountain biking uphill, time trialing on the flat, zooming downhill on your road bike, or tootling along on your hybrid. Bicycle gearing makes the whole thing a re relatively <laughs> pleasant experience. So in the next episode, we're going to look at the selection of gears, the choice of different chain sets and cassettes, and how basically to work out mathematically what is the right gear for you. Thanks for watching, guys. Till next time.